do something different. And corporate entities, they exist because of what's being done. They don't want to do anything different. The very rich, they make their money that way. They don't want to do anything different. So there's a lot of forces in play. You know, it's kind of like uh, Macbeth. Macbeth, everybody told him what to do, but his, um, his particular character that he had did not allow him to do what was sensible. Yeah. It's kind of a part of the human tragedy, really. Yeah. Just like. So people feel all this stuff mm. and they don't know what to do. And so everybody's a bit hysterical and, and running around. And, you know, there's a chance for uh, war, certainly, because people are afraid and they don't know what to do. And um, systems are crashing. And. You know, I mean, the horrible wildfires that Australia had, those were just some of the most horrendous stories I'd ever read. And we're having them in the western United States here, too. Yeah. So we're in difficult times. And the real question is, how do we make our way through this period of time? And, you know, one of the things I talk about in the, the book, Earth Grief, is... Uh, Jacques Cousteau, because I, years and years, like 30 years ago at least, uh, I saw him being interviewed in a television program, and he was talking about the Cousteau Society and all the work he'd done with the oceans and everything. And there was a young woman interviewing him in his boat, and she said, well, do you think that, that you'll win? And he got this weirdest look on his face, as if she was suddenly speaking you know, some strange language he didn't understand. And, and then finally he went, one doesn't do it because one thinks one will win. One does it because one must. Yeah. And he said it in a simple way, just like, well, I'm going to have hamburger for dinner. You know, it's like there was no grandiosity, no, he wasn't caught up in the pain of what was happening to the oceans. He's just going, oh, this is the way they are, and this is what I'm doing now, right? And he figured out on his own what to do, he didn't get permission from anybody. He didn't have somebody tell him what it was. It was his own individual genius that led him to figure out what he could do. Mm -hmm. And that's the way ecosystems work, actually. When the Earth is experiencing a destabilization or an ecosystem is, an impulse is sent into the ecosystem which is sort of a gestalt of the problem. And all of the organisms in that ecosystem begin to respond. The plants begin to make different chemical structures and um, groupings, and things begin to shift as they begin to solve the problem. It's never a top-down process. It's always bottom-up. And so, you know, you see all of these people that are coming up with amazing solutions to things and all of them are outside the system because the system is not going to accept widely divergent solutions so people are creating new kinds of farming new kinds of medicine new kind all different kinds of things and that's what's really fascinating about it because if you've got a you know 100 million people coming up with these massively innovative things that's a lot better than having 12 guys you know in a computer lab coming up with it you know I mean, like you know i think uh they were trying to figure out what was it uh it was aids researchers or something they were trying to figure out how this certain protein was folding so that they could um work with it in the lab and they couldn't figure it out so they put it out on the gamer network which had about 300,000 people on it. They solved it in like 10 days. <laughs> but these guys have been working on it for like years. You know? So I have a lot of faith in people like you and Greta Thunberg and just all of the people that feel something's awry and they're letting some other kind of awareness and intelligence burst forth in them because we're not that different than elephants, you know, or anything else. When... You know, elephants feel a tsunami coming. They all start heading for higher ground while most of the people are standing around going, what, what, you know, because that part of them has been atrophied. 
they don't pay attention. But the, those of us who are feeling these things and deciding to listen to it, we're kind of the elephants heading for higher ground in yeah. response yeah. to what's coming. And so that's why it's, you know, we're ecological beings on an ecological planet. That doesn't change. We've got, you know, millions of years of evolutionary wisdom in our body. And really, when you get into it, our bodies are composed of very sophisticated forms of bacteria, really. And that goes all the way back four and a half billion years to the origins of life on this planet. There's a lot of wisdom in each one of us. And so it makes a lot of sense to trust that and see where it can go rather than completely relying on a science, a reductive science that's only really a couple hundred years old. I mean, if a, you know, if a bristlecone pine that lives 5,000 years, if it only does this important ecological thing once every thousand years, science will never see it. There's an aspen grove that's over 100,000 years old that covers over 100 acres. It's one of the most intelligent neural networks on the planet. If it does something only every 10,000 years, scientists will never see it. And bacteria cover the entire Earth in a membrane. They act pretty much as if they're one functioning unit. They're actually the largest neural network on the planet. And if they do something only every million years, scientists will never see it. There's a lot going on here that that approach can never find. But people can. So Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize for her work on corn transposons, she said, I went no place that the corn did not first tell me to go. She said, you know, I can, I get down with them. They're individuals, you know, they're just like my children. And they'll tell me all kinds of things. And I can actually, when I look, I can actually see their genome rearranging itself. And so she started talking about this, how DNA was a, how the genome was a flexible organ of the cell in the 50s. And at that time, Everybody believed it was static. It was like a program of some sort. And she was ostracized. She wasn't allowed to publicly speak again for over 20 years. Nobody would talk to her. They all thought she was crazy. They'd say, well, you know, I, I appreciate her research, but I don't like her mysticism. She said, it's not mysticism. This is real science. And so she kept at it. And then she wins the Nobel Prize for her work with corn transposons. And that's when everybody started going, yeah, you know, I liked her all, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hung out. I knew her from way back, you know. But the thing is, she was doing a very specific form of holistic science, which can perceive connections and behaviors that reductive science can't. And indigenous cultures, they all develop that kind of science themselves to various degrees, like the Polynesians who settled all of the uh, Pacific islands. They would sail to islands a thousand miles away that they'd never been to before. And they had a very well-established um, way of um, navigating that didn't use anything that the Western world used in their navigational orientation. It was very different, but it worked for them. And they've been reclaiming that. They were forced to quit using it um, by missionaries and the governments that took over their islands. But they're reclaiming it now, and it's uh, it's rather astonishing stuff. So I think there's you know, part of the real hope I have, which is not optimism, is hope is a kind of faith in life itself, really, mm. is that there's this capacity within the human species to adapt in the, in the most important way possible to change our own climate of mind, our own orientation, 
so that we can once again become earth itself that we re-inhabit our inner being and there's this other kind of way of doing science and thinking that still retains our most human qualities and that as you do it love is enhanced ethics is enhanced moral behavior is enhanced because they're naturally a part of that way of being in relationship to the world. All indigenous cultures were aware of that. Polynesian navigators are. And so um, that's what I have faith in. Hey, welcome to Today Dreamer, a podcast and YouTube channel where we explore the interplay between inner and outer work. And we look at what cultivating the practice of presence within our lives feels and looks like once we clear the mind and open the heart. So this is just a short clip from a full podcast episode, which I'll leave a link to around here somewhere. And if you'd like to check out the whole catalog of episodes along with guided meditations and what I have on offer, um, please head over to todaydreamer.com and have a peek. Also, uh, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and click the little notification bell so you don't miss any of the good stuff to come.